Uh, it's really wonderful to have everybody here. Uh, so you get to actually experience Manchester of, of how I look at it, which can be a little bit, does this sound strange to you? Or is it me? I have like a little echo going on in my head, which that's not unusual. It's a little hollow in there. So once in a while I can hear an echo and a little feedback and some other voices jump in. This is a great opportunity to talk about the industrial past of Manchester, why it was Factory Point, when it became Manchester Center. And I get to share all kinds of photographs with you. And you know, we're going to weave together a story. Bill's here, so we're gonna, definitely going to hear about some trains. And, it, and we're going to throw a few facts in there, as my good friend in the back row there, Dave Canal, would say. We're going to tell a story, throw a few facts in there, lots of pictures. And I went overboard on a few of the pictures just because I love the old photographs, and this is probably the few chances that people are actually going to get to see them. So and you, since you were all my hostage tonight, you're going to get to sit through it. Uh, this actually, this painting, which is going to kick us off, this is actually a, pain, a painting by Gene Pelham from uh, Lyman Orton's collection. And Bill's going to tell you a little story about So many of the early settlements were just uphill of it. And Manchester Village was that case. Uh, there are other towns, Grafton was way up on the hill. They eventually tore that town down and moved it down and reestablished it down lower. Um, but there was one catch. There was no, no water power. And before other forms of steam and stuff came along, you really need stream and you need stream with gravity drop from feet. So, the second settle, the first settlement was Manchester Village. They, they had you know, church and store and saloon. Um, but then quickly they settled along the Battenkill because you needed water power. Every small town in Vermont had some sort of industry. There was the blacksmith, there was a, a grist mill and a sawmill because unless you were trying to do it by horse or by hand, you needed water power. But Manchester kind of went in it in a big way. So what I wanted to start with, originally before Factory Point, when it was first settled, it was actually settled by the Mead family. Uh, Timothy Mead and his son, Timothy Mead Jr., you know, they actually were part of the original settlers of here. They weren't, they weren't grant holders, but they did come up here in 1765 to begin surveying. Now, one of the things about Mead, he owned two 100-acre lots, which encompassed most of Manchester Center, hence why it was actually called Mead's Mill, because he came here, he built a grist mill, a place to live, all along the West Branch, uh, a fulling mill, a small tannery, sawmill store. Uh, Judge John Pettibone wrote in 1860 in his early history of Manchester, on 200 acres owned by Timothy Mead, I believe there was not a family living during his lifetime except his sons and one or two families who carried on at the mills stores, etc. For at least 20 years, that area was known as Mead's Mill. He didn't sell any of his, any of his land. He just wouldn't sell it. There's some speculation maybe he was holding on to it because he thought it was going to be worth a little bit more money. There's Judge Lovell and Munson in 1875 uh, wrote that uh, Mr. Mead was decidedly averse to selling any of his land and his policy in that particular greatly retarded the development of that place. The committee for the location of county buildings proposed the to place the courthouse in jail about where the present Baptist Church meeting house stands, but Mr. Mead met their application for a building lot with an absolute refusal and said to have given the committee his opinion of the courts and lawyers in terms more vigorous than polite. <laughs> so, so he wouldn't sell anything, but he did have one, he was a Baptist, so he actually did sell a little bit of land to the, to the Baptist. And if we look up here on the screen, let me see here just really quick. Uh, Right up here is Timothy Mead's signature. This is the only thing that we have, and actually he was illiterate, so he just made his mark. Timothy Soper was another one, Isaac Welpley, and Jeremiah Welpley. And only Isaac actually could write his name. Everybody else just made his mark. Uh, the, whoops, holy smokes. Holy smokes. Uh, 
the one thing that he did, he did sell the land for, it was for the sole use and convenience of a meeting house, home or house, and for the use and convenience of burying the dead. Now, Meade died in 1802, and his sons began selling off those lands ra rather rapidly. Uh, and, but still, for another 20 years or so, it was rather quiet. That original meeting house was about where you see the X on the screen, uh, right about here. That's today's Factory Point Cemetery. You can see we're actually all sitting up here in the Manchester Community Library. So the original cemetery was this section right here. And it was known as Meeting House Hill at the time. And the Meeting House actually stood there for until about 1833 when it moved to its present location at the corner of Bonnet and Main Street. And the cemetery itself fell into disrepair and there's a long story about that, which I gave a talk on Gmall about the Stone Guards of Manchester. So if you want to know a little bit more about Factory Point Cemetery, you can actually go and look that up. You know, it's interesting to think that if Meade had sold, the, sold land to the town and they could have put the courthouse here and put some of the other town offices, Factory Point would probably have been a little bit more of a, of a, uh, a landing spot for people, but instead it was, everything was done in the village. Um, you know, this is actually a picture of the, the entrance to Factory Point at the time. It was just known as the burying ground. That gate was actually built in 1939. The very first mention we have of Factory Point in the newspapers takes place, this is from 1821. Uh, and you can see it just basically says 35 acres of land situated a few rods north of Manchester North Village called Factory Point. I was actually surprised to actually see it called Factory Point that early. Now, exactly when they started calling it and when they switched from Meads Mill to Factory Point, I'm not exactly sure. And records for Manchester are very, very spotty at best through that period. A lot of times they're just oral recollections. But really from 1820 till into the 1830s and 1840s, it was a very quiet little part of town. Uh, outside of the mills, because Mead had never done it, the village had their own their own little world going on there. A lot of taverns, as I understand. Uh, but it wasn't really till you know, 1830, you can see, we started to see more business starting to come here. You see property was being sold, and it was really from the 1840 to 1860 that witnessed some of the, the big changes. Uh, this really kind of brought in the, the opening of Manchester, and it was the opening of the Western Vermont Railroad, which Bill will tell you about here in a minute, in 1852, that was really another major important event. Um, you, know, the, you know, the Industrial Revolution that was taking place in America also came to Manchester. And it was Myron Clark, the honorary Myron Clark, who actually originally came from Rupert and his son. It was called the Chief Instigator. Uh, you know, he purchased up a lot of Meade's original, like he purchased where the grist mill was, he purchased some of the mills, he purchased the tannery, and he really started expanding upon that. Has anybody ever been near a tannery? <laughs> so I was, down, I was down near a tannery in Georgia when I was a little kid. It's, it's burned into my memory. I mean, the smell of a tannery has a very, you know, I mean, some of the chemicals they use in it, and I can only imagine what it'd be like if that tannery was still in existence today. <laughs> We'd be able to smell it from here. But uh, it was really, the railroad really changed how industry came in here. And his son, Augustus, which we'll hear a lot more about, was also came in. And you can see actually in this 1830 uh, print, of, you can see leather for sale by the subscriber at wholesale or retail. And he was also seeking uh, leather, hides, and skins. Trapping and hunting was an enormous industry here for years. Uh, you know, the amount of bears, all kinds of small animals. Uh, actually, the last panther in Vermont was actually shot up on East Mountain. And actually, I think it's the one that's actually, it's, they said it, it's taxidermied in up north somewhere in one of the things. Maybe it's at the Fairbanks Museum. I think it's Montpelier. Or is it Montpelier? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, one of the things I love about going through the, the ephemera in the collection is looking at all the old handbills. You know, before they had printing presses, they would just, this is actually signed by uh, Augustus Clark, Myron's son. Uh, this is billed out to the Bradley Mill, who made butter, butter boxes down in, the, down in the depot, about where Building 7 is right now, I think is where they were, right? <laughs> Building 7 at RK Miles. And it says on here, Dear Sir, you will notice that we have the advanced price of meal, 10 cents for 100 pounds, while feed remains same. Corn has advanced rapidly for a few days, and it may be necessary for us to make further advance, in which case we will advise you. Yours truly, Augustus Clark. Inflation. <laughs> uh, but 
This picture actually shows the Bradley Mill maybe probably about... 1890s? Yeah, so maybe about 50 years after, 40 years yeah. after that. I mean, there was a sawmill in this location. It's now RK Miles. They also, sawmills have it in their DNA, they burn down. So there was a series of sawmills here, and they would burn, they'd put another one here. And this one, Bradley's Mills grew, it came with other names, and there was a, it was, what was the one that, that specifically on the sign it said butter boxes and... Right, Manchester Lumber. Manchester Lumber, yeah. And it was, and this is judging from the, the locomotive, which unfortunately had the smoke drifting towards it. It's about 1890. This is, we're in, we sort of talked about this. We're not technically in the area that people think of as Manchester Center, because like the village was settled and Factory Point was settled, when the railroad came through, it missed both of them. So the new settlement became the depot. However, these weren't long, un, the village is a corporate entity that was done later, but everything else isn't a corporate, it's just, it's a neighborhood, and there were no hard lines on it. So when the railroad came through, there was no Manchester Depot. They built the station there, but there were towns, there were settlements, there was, you know, Robertsville, and a lot of it was the schools that were there, um, or Barnumville. Barnumville actually had a post office for a while, so I think much of it was, what was the postal address that you were using? So we won't stick exactly in what you think of now. Actually, it's Manchester Village and everything else is the center by the post office. Right. So we're, we're just, basically it's industrial Manchester. Yeah, we're drawn outside the lines a little bit. <laughs> what lines? Uh, <laughs> uh, by 1856, you can see that the, you know, the, the business directory from the map that was printed, you know, you'll look up here, you'll see all the attorneys up here, Mr. Minor, Mr. Burton, Mr. Fowler, Mr. Burton, they were all in the village. And then we get down into all the marble dealers and the manufacturers. These were all down in the center, Gilman Wilson. Uh, and this is Isaac Wilson, his son. And then you see Freedley, McDonald, and White. Freedley would be, if anybody's ever been up to Freedley Quarry uh, up, up in Dorset, that's the same Freedleys. Uh, and then, you know, obviously Augustus Clark. Augustus had his hands, you know, like his father. They really were the ones who to go to in Manchester. Uh, or Factory Point at the time, because they had their hands in every part of business that was going on. You know, Pete Wyman, there's still some Wymans walking amongst us. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Pete Wyman uh, as we get down. And of course, then we go back to the village, you know, the hotels were, you know, Vanderlips Hotel and the Equinox. So it's kind of a neat to look at, you know, all the different businesses that were listed or paid to have themselves listed in 1856, which brings us to, this is what Factory Point or Manchester Center looked like in 1856. We're probably sitting right about here today. Cemetery, you got Main Street coming down. This is where, Mal where, Mal where the rotary is, malfunction junction. <laughs> and this would be Bonnet Street going up this way. Just bringing it in a little bit closer. Actually, I'll just tell you that um, one of the, uh, you know, I wanted to find out where did the Clarks live. And everybody knows where Gringo Jacks well, that house was actually built by Lyman Harrington, not related to me. He built the store next door, which is now uh, Northshire Living, owned by Chris Conti and his wife, and, and the house. And actually, Myra, that was my, so Lyman actually sold his house to Myron Clark. And Augustus built a new farmhouse, which later, much later, would become uh, the Landmark Gift Shop and in 1964 was picked up and moved to Landmark Lane and was uh, Dr. Madcore's house for, I think it may have just sold, I'm not sure, but, um, and that, all that area, like right here where you can see like A.G. Clark, that would be about where Walgreens is today. And then when we go up by Adams Park, you have the Union Store, which is Northshire Living, M.C. Clark's, that would be Gringo Jack's schoolhouse, which is where the original schoolhouse stood until, uh, until 1950, and then it was torn down in the 70s, and then you have the Zion Church. Anything you want to chime in there about Mr. Badger? Anything about pick, pick. <laughs> <laughs> um, It's an even closer view of, of Factory Point. You know, this is the area where we would have Factory Point Green today. You got Wyman's Mill. You know, I want to mention M. Slocum. So Martin Slocum, Martin lived in, he, the Slocum family bought, I got voices in my head again. 
I got uh, Martin Slocum purchased Timothy Mead's home, which was about where the bookstore is today. And I'm going to veer off a little bit because uh, Martin Slocum is actually just outside the way here in, in uh, Factory Point. Uh, <laughs> he also owned. Uh, he also he also owned a number of buildings going up Bonnet Street, including actually the the, the W. H. Shaw Insurance Building, and which he sold in 1833 for 90 dollars. Actually, Mike Powers actually shared with me the bill of sale. So I think Andy's here. Andy, I'll give you a hundred. <laughs> uh, yeah, it probably won't happen. But the reason why I wanted to bring up Martin Slocum, because when I first came across his grave and I looked next door, I looked right next to him and, and he had four wives buried right next to him. So it was like, wow, you know. I mean, you know, mortality was a little bit of a different thing in the, in the mid-1800s, but, you know, when I looked at it, I was like, I wonder what wife number three must have thought if she ever went to the cemetery or not. But it also kind of brings forth another story. And so... Bruce Werner, he lives down in Florida. He was the four-time great-grandson of wife number three. I'm sorry, wife number two. And so he calls up and he says, uh, yeah, I had these pillowcases that were embroidered by Betsy Mosley. She was Martin Slocum's second wife. And, I, and as soon as he said that, I said, she was number two of four. And he was like, oh, my God, you know that story? <laughs> <laughs> And she died in, in 1843, so he was thrilled because he had had these, they'd been you know, passed down through the generations, and they were sent up, and this is actually Freddie taking a look, uh, Frederica Templeton, who was the president of the Historical Society, taking a look, and you know, the embroidery is just really, really quite lovely, and so it was just really neat to actually have a tangible piece that connects us with, um, you know, with Mr. Slocum and one of his four wives. Um, you know, when we get to 1869, you can see it's even, you know, the buildings are starting to grow up even more. You can see there's more mills going on. This is where the tannery oh, it disappeared, where the tannery, the tannery sits right here. I can tell you I don't have very much control over my mouse right now. And the marble's down here. And you can just really, as we look up, I'm just going to go with my laser pointer. Oh. Up here, so we have, this is where the Baptist Church is now located at the corner. Um, you can see now Mr. Smith owns, the, owns uh, where Northshire Bookstore is. Uh, G. Wilson is, is Gilman Wilson, and that's where the Vermont News Guide building was, which is you know, just next north of uh, where Charlie's is. And all these AGC, AGC, AG Clark, so that's the Clarks. Um, they owned probably uh, the majority of the landholders at that time kind of like the Donny Doors of their day. <laughs> uh, you, you, you notice along in the lower part, all the marble works, Marble Mill, uh, Vermont uh, Italian Marble Company. All down in this section. Stone Shop. So that was sort of the, the marble center of, no, there were no marble quarries in Manchester. Well, there was one later. Right, much later. So where'd the marble come from? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. Mount Aeolus, of course. So there are 29 quarries of varying size. Some of them are just a one block whacked out of, the, out of the side of the mountain. But all the marble really, I mean, it truly was the marble, is the marble mountain. And they would bring, you know, the, there was Teamsters, two, second and third generation Teamsters who would, bring, who would haul the marble down from the mountain down to Manchester to the mills. And one of them was Peter Wyman, uh, and his son Edmund was a doctor. And Wyman's Lane, over by where Vermont Kitchen Supply is, that's named after uh, Peter's son. And when we really get into some detail here, is the, this is the 1870, uh, 1885 uh, Sanborn map. I want to read you something. It was actually written by uh, D.K. Simons, who was the editor of the Manchester Journal. And he talks about, it was great because he gave a first-hand account of what it was like coming down here to haul uh, hemlock bark. He said, on my next visit, so he would be hauling bark down. And these sheds, these, these large sheds right here, they would use, they just put hemlock bark. They would stack it. And he said, my next visits to Manchester were three years later when I drove a team hauling bark to Clark's, Tavern, uh, Clark's Tannery. When the weather and roads were good, this was a pleasant occupation, but when the thermometer was far below zero and the wind blowing and the snow drifting up the roads, it was anything but pleasant. An ordinary load was one quart of bark, and for it, when delivered, was paid the, ma the magnificent sum of $3. 
To describe the energy put forth to produce a cord of bark will explain the energy put forth of the early settlers of Manchester in securing their homes. In June, after planting had been finished and the hot days have started the sap to run in the hemlocks, we start for the forest after, this is up in Peru, by the way. Uh, we start for the forest and after proceeding into the depths about a mile or more, we come to some giant trees. First, they must be felled. Then, they're deprived, they're deprived of their limbs and then measured, then cut around through the bark with an ax, and then the bark stripped off with an instrument called a spud. This had a handle of wood and the lower part being iron flattened out with a carving at the bottom. The bark was piled and the logs were left to rot. Uh, an ordinary day's work was one cord in which a man was paid 75 cents. A man could not stop to rest or he'd be eaten up by mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, so that was, just, you know, it's kind of a first-hand account of what it was like to supply the mills. And this is, the reason why I read this to you is this is going to play in a little bit, a little bit later down, down through the presentation. Uh, so not only did they have the large tannery, which is basically took up most of what is Factory Point Green today, across, across the way you had, you had the, at this time it was called the Harris and the Dench, um, the woolen mill. And you'll notice large pond here. You know, band up, and here's the West Branch. So the grist mill is still right exactly where it is. And you see there's walkways going across the, uh, across the river. So, uh, so doing uh, the river walk, the thing, not a new idea. <laughs> uh, there were, the, it was dammed, at least the, the dam is still there next to the grist mill. There was another dam behind the tannery, and then there was another dam down here, which was called the BB Dam in later years. And then there was a raceway that went down to feed the, feed the marble mill that was down here. At the time, it was the Russell Colvin uh, uh, feed mill, it eventually became the BB Mill. Much later, it became the Sirloin Saloon. So, so just remember this little, this little section of the, uh, of the talk here. All these houses that we see, all these, all these buildings over here on the, those were all tenement houses for the workers. So when I saw this picture of, of, the, of, the, of the Waterhouse hosiery mill, I was like, wow, where was that? And did it exist, or was it just kind of an artist embellishment of what happened? You know, they had manufactured horse blankets, uh, reportedly Union blankets during the Civil War, numerous textiles. Uh, downstairs, we actually have this large ledger, it's about this thick, where you go through, and it's just all little swatches of cloth, which is just fascinating to look through uh, when it was owned by the Harrises. And, you know, who were the people who did this? This is actually a picture that was taken probably in the mid-1870s, of a lot of the ladies who worked at the woolen mills. And they are posed actually about where Adams Park is today, would be across, the, they'd be sitting across the, now you'd be looking at the front of the funeral home and over here you can see the Zion Church. You can see just the front of the Zion Church here. And I look at all these ladies and they're getting ready to go to work and you just look at how they're dressed. I mean, you know, I mean, they are, and it's probably five or six layers deep minimum. <laughs> and they were going in to work in a mill they definitely did not have air conditioning back then. Uh, the earliest photo we have of Manchester Center or Factory Point would be this. 18, this is probably about 1868, 1869. So, what are we really looking at here? Right here in the middle of this large pond, this is about where the car dealership is today. That woolen mill, and I said, wow, with the spires, that's right here. It's about where today's Valero is. It was a Sunoco. For some of you people who've been around for a while, it'd be Casey's. Casey's SO. <laughs> Casey's SO. And for you've been here for a really long time, it'd be Bohr's SO. Uh, this is the one picture we have of Mead's Tavern, or later Mr. Martin Slocum's house. This would be Mountain Goat today, or the combination cash. And you can see the distinctive little passageway underneath there, the grist mill. Way back here, this, these little white things, that's actually Factory Point Cemetery. You can see the spires of the Baptist Church, the original one. They built a new belfry and removed that original, and then it doesn't have the spires anymore. And there's the spires of the Zion. So, and down here, I'm going to do a little bit, a little bit of a close-up. So this gives you there's Meads, Meads Tavern, the Slocum House. Here's where the little passageway under. And you'll see they have a, it's a pony truss pony bridge. Trust. Pony so trust. there was a wooden. So we're going to get into the bridge. Now, that junction, like how it was a problem for generations of people who probably remember it, 
uh, it, was a, it was a problem from the beginning because they needed, they couldn't, by any means, they couldn't bury the river because everything ran on water power. So they needed to keep this, this funnel open, but they constantly needed to enlarge and make it better and make it sturdier. One thing that's kind of interesting about this picture is looking at what Main Street looked like. I mean, Main Street just had a few little buildings as it swept up and nothing like it looks today, obviously. Mostly wooden buildings and there were at least three times that Main Street got wiped out by, by fires, by flowers, by fires. Um, so the building that uh, Ed Campbell's law office in, made out of brick, not an accident. <laughs> or uh, where we know the Up for Breakfast, those, both those buildings, the, the Campbell Law Office and were Up for Breakfast, those were built in about 1873, 74, and they were built at the same time. Uh, one little story I want to tell you about the, uh, the woolen mill. And, and why it's connected. This is actually a picture of uh, Harry Adams. Uh, Harry actually was born and died at the house that's right on Adams Park. He was born in uh, 1874 and he died in 1964. And he was a jeweler and his daughter Janet, and her granddaughter Janet, actually when I used to post pictures she would message me and tell me all these great little stories which I've saved. And this is one of the stories that she told me. She said, uh, she said, when Harry was seven years old, it was her grandfather. He wasn't working there. He was actually working at, he was at the woolen mill, the one that was where the uh, Valero is today. He was helping open a picker, which opened uh, cotton bales, and his left arm got caught up and was badly mangled. The doctor wanted to amputate his arm, but his father said no. And even though it was smaller, and was bent, he was still able to repair watches, clocks, play musical instruments, test people's eyes, and adjust their glasses. He never let it slow him down for anything. Um, and you can notice if you look at his left hand, you notice how his left hand's a little bit bent over and a little, a little bit shorter. And he did indeed, he was actually, he was part of the, he was a founding member of the Manchester band. He is actually standing right here, and you can see there's his, his left hand that wasn't quite right. He's actually standing next to Paul Fowler. Uh, this photo was taken about 1917, and they were standing actually against what's today the Brewster uh, or the funeral home. Then it was the Methodist Church. And we actually have that drum in our collection, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, but this is about 1885, and this will really tell you. Now you can tell it's a little bit later because now you can see the you know, you can see the mansard roof. That's the Northshire bookstore as we know it today. Back then it was the Colburn House. It was built in 1872. Uh, up here is Estabrook's, uh, uh, Estabrook's, actually I should be using this so the people at home can see what I'm talking about. So right here is the, where the bookstore is. And then up here is Estabrook's, uh, Estabrook's Opera, House. Opera House, which burned down in 1894, another one of those fires. Actually, Michael Heinel said he read his grandfather's uh, diary and the fire was so hot he was across the street in the brick building because actually J.C. Heinels originally started down there and they lived upstairs. The fire was so hot that it melted all the windows on the front. Um, you can see where the mountain goat is and you can, see, you can really see the extent of the tannery business and here's the woolen mill again. And now you can see instead of there, there being a little wooden, wooden truss pony, pony, pony bridge, they actually have an iron bridge. So they made it a little bit wider, a little bit sturdier. That wouldn't last either. And actually what you can see stretching across from the back of about where the grist mill is across the street to this, this other building is a walkway. It's the bridge that's one of the two bridges that spanned the West Branch so they wouldn't have to go up and walk around. So it was kind of interesting when I was hearing that, you know, the river walk wants to extend the bridge across. They say, well, they just walk around. And I'm like, well, you know, they didn't want to do it back then either. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, now this is looking back in the other direction. So this is basically standing at Center Hill, looking back towards, so this building right here, you can see there's that woolen mill that's about where the, the, the Valerio station is. So you're looking at this dam down here is the BB, would become the BB Marble Mill Dam. That would be right about where our turbine is on Riverwalk. And this is, the, this is all tannery here, all these buildings, are all gone now. These were all a number of carriage shops and a uh, number of things. And you can see, and there's the second walkway going across the West Branch. And down here is, is, the, is the second dam. And you can see the dam that's next to the Grist Mill, which is still there today. 
and, and as a landmark, more than the church spires is the tannery smokestack. And you can pick that out of photographs all over the place. So Myron Clark, I mean, he had his hand, I mean, I mentioned that he was a large landowner, but he was also one of the original trustees at Burr Seminary, uh, you know, which later became Burn Burton. What's up? Uh, and then uh, it, 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 part of the, of the railroad. How's it going, buddy? That way. You good? <laughs> um, isn't that cool? We have a guest speaker tonight. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, so why did this large, why did this large tannery and such a large operation basically cease to exist? When you look at it, in when when you see the amount of buildings that were were there in the 1880s and the 1890s. Well, what happened to all this? And there's a number of factors, but thankfully, Mr. Simons actually wrote about that. Hemlock bark became to, began to be scarce. It was a major component in the tannery, and you know, they cut down all the, all the hemlocks up in Peru in every place they could find them. So there really wasn't a lot that they could draw from regularly. So it went from $3 a cord, which was the old price, to as high as $9. Um, and it was also true that the leather prices were higher, but the big tanneries formed a syndicate and they controlled the market and the syndicate cornered the market on hides and selected the best, basically kind of choking out all these smaller, smaller tannery operations, which the one at Factory Point would have qualified as. Um, so there was really nothing left for business. So as much as the Clarks had the ability to support the business for a long time because it supported so many of the workers, eventually the math just did not work. And when, it, when the operation ceased, it was rather abrupt. And Myron died in 1860, and his son carried on for a while longer, but eventually he died, and nobody was really there with the pockets deep enough to keep it going. And the larger tannery operations in the, in the, in the metropolitan in the west and down south, they kind of put our little factory point out of business. So Bill was mentioning, actually, let me go back here. I'm going to go back one slide. There we go. So this, now we've gone, we've gone down the, a little bit further down Center Hill, and you can still see where the tannery is. And then down here, we see this, these buildings. So when we were mentioning all the marble mills, that's all the marble mills that were down there. Now, the marble mills, the marble business was, I mean, really, really big business. Um, when Dr. E.L. Wyman, who was, who was Peter, Peter Wyman's son, Actually, he actually wrote downstairs, we had this, and he said he was in a position to know how, how the business worked. He said during his time, there were, there were five marble mills on the west branch of the Battenkill. This would all be about where Friends of the Sun is today. They were all right there up through where Sotheby's is. Um, that's where all the mills were. And he said they had the, the same number on the brook running this side of Judge Munson's residence. So when they talk about Munson's, all the brook, along the brook of Munson's, so if you dr drive down, what's that called, Longview Farm? Longview Farm, there's a little stream that kind of cuts through there. Well, believe it or not, at one point there were five or six marble mills that were built alongside of that river, um, which is hard to kind of wrap our heads around today. Um, you know, it may be readily inferred that there was much more water running those streams than at, at, at present. The chief reason for the failure of the water is the cutting of the timber, especially the softwood. There's little to hold the water back and it comes down in floods that the entire streams quickly start to dry up and lose their volume. Um, this was the case for all the smaller mills and the aggregate production was large, but the more marble that came down, they just weren't able to keep up. And then as the larger, larger companies up in Rutland, they would come down and, and a lot of the marble started going north for processing. So it really kind of meant the end of, of you know, large-scale marble operations, or I should say, the, or I should say, the mom and pop operations. Is it me? Uh, but when I look at that picture, I mean, I just love it. You know, thinking that there were all these marble mills and the large tannery. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of what it looked like by 1927, this is 19, this is the 1927 flood. This area right here is about where Price Chopper is today. 
Up here is Riverside, it, River, River, yeah, River, Riverside Heights. These two, these two houses here, the third one burned down, but these are right here still by the Bagel Works. You can actually walk up and you know, kind of look, see them standing side by side. Uh, down here on the far left, this building is where Ted's Barbershop is. And over here in the back, you can't really see it really, really great, but that's actually the Norcross West Marble Mill, which we will touch on them a little bit later. Um, so Depot Street, and after all the mills were gone, it was pretty quiet. And so you think that in the 1870s, 1880s, there were all these mills there, and by 1927, there wasn't a single trace of them. Probably got flooded out a few times. Um, and we are going to touch a little bit on Fullerton's, and actually this is going to be a great little segue because this is taken in Manchester Depot, and this long building we see over here on the right, uh, on the right is the depot station. And you know that means Bill's going to tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> the station is still there and used as storage for RK Miles, but it was before the platform was covered, which was 1870-something. And so it's an open platform, and the building with all the marble was Fullerton's Marble Works. And he was the first one. I, I said the, the railroad missed the, the settlements that were here. So it was kind of open fields. And Fullerton saw the potential. And the other thing he saw is basically going to geography classes half a century ago, what establishes where a business sets up. And it has to do with power, transportation, and raw materials. And so Pittsburgh, you can define why is Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Three Rivers, and centrally located to coal and, and ore. Um, so Fullerton realized transportation. The railroad is here. If you're gonna have a marble works, if you're gonna make stuff, be by the tracks. And you can load up stuff. And uh, that's what he was doing. And the building behind it, he also was foresighted enough to say, people are gonna be moving here. This is, this is not just me. So he built the store. And that was the first commercial building in the depot area. And it's still there as Fireflies. Firefly. Um, and there's nothing else around it. Yeah, Firefly or yeah, out to lunch or the old taco house. Taco house. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, and this, and this, and this, this, uh, this barn garage it would be a barn back then. It got picked up and turned side. It got turned uh, 90 degrees, right? Yeah, 90 degrees, and was there for a number of years. And actually, I think it's, I think it's uh, Bill West actually remember. I think his parents lived above that for a while. He always. Uh, um, but that's long since gone. This is a little closer up of what Fullerton's look like. Um, this building is still there. It's now painted yellow and is the corporate offices for RK Miles. Uh, when I go around the back, there's been some additions onto it, but you can see that everything was on the back because they wanted to load it onto the trains. And tens of thousands of gravestones were, were produced here at, in the wake of the Civil War. So there's a, there is a, um, there is a, quarry up on Mount Ale is called the Gettysburg Quarry, which a lot of the headstones came for. Now, whether or not how many of them went to the Gettysburg because it was open in 1868, the quarry, and by then all the headstones were already in at the actual cemetery in Gettysburg. But I mean, people continue to be buried there, so maybe they did uh, make some makes some of the Gettysburg Quarry marble made it to Gettysburg. But Fullerton had contracts for tens of thousands. He was good friends with Redfeld Proctor, who Proctorsville. And he just happened to be uh, <clears throat> on the appropriations committee down in Washington, so that's why. <laughs> he sent a lot of business up to uh, West Rutland and did so much business that they actually named the town after him, Proctorsville. <laughs> and I've seen this picture, I don't know how many times, but every time you look at it, you see something else. And he needed a more loading dock. And he needed some supports for it. So if you look over there, you see odds and ends of scraps of marble, but it looks like the turn base of something that must have had a defect. And, you know, what do we need? Well, stick that under there. Yeah. And when I've gone out in the back, and if you look under, you can still, you know, there's a lot of random, random Decent. blocks. Yeah. And just in case anybody ever finds it, once in a while, we will get somebody, somebody will inquire at the Historical Society, somebody will find a gravestone. And they'll be like, oh my God, there's somebody buried in my garden. There's actually one over here on Highland Avenue. She called up and was like, oh, what is it? And, um, you know, if they made a spelling error in a soldier's name and somebody double checked it and they said, oh, you know, I mean, it's a piece of marble. So what are you going to do with it? I mean, you know, yeah. so they, you flip it over and use it for paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think, or if somebody didn't pay their bill. Yes. <laughs> we actually have one downstairs that came from, uh, from Palmer Place over here, and it was used as a support down in the basement. It was a piece of marble underneath one of the things. <laughs> they pulled it out and flipped it over, and it was a headstone. <laughs> um, this is a picture of the, the station from the side that you usually see it. This is R.K. Miles' yard now. And the station's still there. They, it went through, this was a very common first generation Western Vermont station with a cross gable. Uh, Danby was this way, East Dorset was this way, Shaftesbury, South Shaftesbury, and the original Bennington. And the agent lived upstairs. And if you go up in this building now, you can see the framing where this dormer had been, and it probably leaked, and they tore that off, and they put small dormers on, and then they leaked, and they put some skylights in, and then the agent didn't live there anymore, so they just you know, became storage. Uh, it's still got a bit of gingerbread that hasn't been knocked off. And out in the yard, there's a stiff leg derrick. And you can't tell what is there, but it looks like marble blocks. So besides bringing in by horse, were they bringing marble from East Dorset? Were they shipping marble out to Proctor and West Rutland? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we don't know much about it, but <clears throat> stiff leg Derrick's pretty heavy duty piece of equipment for just loading you know, boxes. Um, the, what's interesting, the station itself goes along right about where little further on, that's the end of the station. And the building beyond it looks like as big as a station. It was the woodshed. Locomotives burned wood. And they went through hundreds of cords of wood. And if you look at Sanborn maps of this area, the same thing in around 1900, you'll see the woodshed. And then after they started converting to coal, they still had some wood burners apparently because it was a big pile and just said wood pile out in, out in probably pretty much where that boxcar is parked. Um, but they tore, the, they tore the woodshed down and added onto the station at one point. Which, here's a little factoid. So if you go to Miles, and if you're going into the lumber yard and you look back at the station, you're gonna notice that that section actually is built with the curve of the railroad track. So it kind of goes down and then it kind of makes a little jog. Now, how I made it all my life without knowing that, I don't know, but Bill told me about it. And now every time I go there, I look at it and I say, oh yeah, it does twist. You can actually see it from the, from the uh, other There's side the too. Side. Yeah, you can, you can still yeah. see it. Um, you know, so the marble, so marble couldn't go over the bridge. So when marble came into Manchester with the Teamsters, I mentioned they were, the Teamsters hauled everything down. And th this is actually the Teamsters, this is their Adams Park. So you can see this is the steeple of the, of, the, uh, of the Methodist Church, which is actually the funeral home now. Over here, that's the Adams House, which is still there. It looks exactly the same for the most part. And over here is the steeple of the, of the center school, which actually was torn down in 67. And actually that steeple, this little, little belfry, the top of it is actually on Mount Aeolus Lane on the west property. So if you're going down uh, on the rail trail and you look over in this person's dooryard and you see this big hulking mass with a point on top of it, you say, what's that? It's actually the steeple to the center hill, uh, the center school. So they couldn't bring marble across that bridge because it couldn't handle it, even though it was iron. That piece of marble probably weighs, uh, you know, 30 tons. So they couldn't bring it across, so they'd have to go down center hill and bring it back up you know, what would be Depot Street today to where the mills are. You know, this shot actually was probably taken about 1900, and it's a really fuzzy, fuzzy picture, so it's, the picture is about this big. And the reason why I like it is because you can actually see a Teamster with his marble. This building is that brick building that is now the Campbell uh, law office. This is the, uh, the Madison block, which was torn down in the 1970s, and this is where you'd sit outdoors if you were having dinner at Union Underground and the Baptist Church. And you see there's nothing in between there. So, because it was still, fires had wiped out everything that was there and nothing had been built back up again. And you, even the next building that was built in 1904 was built out of brick. Um, you know, and as I mentioned before, you know, so what, it was really the, the, the larger uh, business 
you know, the larger tannery operations basically squeezed out the smaller, the smaller, uh, the smaller operations like we had here. So this picture was taken down on the West Branch, and you look, if you parked over, if you parked over by Riverwalk down behind Friends of the Sun and looked up at the hill, this is what you would have seen. It's probably one of the last pictures that was taken. You can see this large thing here. This is that dam that fed the fed the turbine that was underneath the, the marble mill, the BB marble mill, which be, would become the Sirloin Saloon. And by 1900, it was in complete shambles. So, you know, we talked a little bit about the workers, and a lot of them were Irish, Italian, French, French Canadians, the same as they worked in, in, the, uh, in, the marble, in the marble business. But, you know, this time was also a time where child labor was a major issue. And by 1913, Sarah Cleghorn, uh, had written the golf links. The golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. So she lived in Manchester, so it was kind of a little bit of a play on you know the fact that we had the mills in the in, in the factory point, and then we had the golf links, the Equinox, and then Aquanic uh, a little bit later. It wouldn't have worked out that way because by the time the golf courses were built, factory point was gone, all the mills were gone, but. This, when it was written in 1913 and published, it caused quite a, quite a sensation. And she was the journalist for the Historical Society. We have a number of her, um, her journals downstairs of her everyday observations. And Robert Frost actually said of her in the foreword to her autobiography, to a saint reformer like Sarah Cleghorn, the great importance is not to get, rid, get hold of both ends, but the right end. She was a partisan. Um, I looked up a little fact, in 1900, at least 6% of all American workers were under the age of 16. And a lot of times much younger than that. And I'm embarrassed to say that my 16, 17 year old does not have a job right now, so. <laughs> um, one of the things about Factory Point, well, why did they change the name Factory Point? Well, as the village was coming alive and being a, you know, being a destination, and there was a large summer colony that had been building really from the 1850s up until, uh, the, up until the 1880s, they didn't want to have Factory Point as the next little village because everybody's escaping the cities and escaping the factories. So they want to have a place that doesn't have the industrial stigma next to it. So you can see a quick word on there. Summer places, cities were not healthy before air conditioning and, and advanced sewage processing. You wanted to get out. And I was reading somewhere just the other day that um, Teddy Roosevelt's mother and wife died on the same day because of unhealthy conditions in cities. And he went out west to be a rancher. Um, so anyone who could afford it, wives, kids went out of the city for the summer and North Bennington was Troy, New York in the summer. All the families moved over. The social scene was the same thing. Um, the men came over on weekends or whenever they could get over. Um, and this was standard practice. So Manchester was a summer resort for people getting out of the city. And Sean said, why is Factory Point right here? You know, it's, it's not good for business. Yeah. So you can see, uh, using the Colburn House as, as an example, some of their letterheads, you can see in the 1870s it was a factory point. And in 1886, they changed the name from factory point to Manchester Center down here. And you can see they spelled it C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, make it a little more exotic sounding, I suppose, uh, which caused a lot of confusion at the post office. And, <laughs> and, by, and by, uh, by 1895, they changed it to uh, Manchester Center, you know, spelled C-E-N-T-E-R. And... This is actually, it's kind of interesting, J.A. Thayer, he was, he was a proprietor at the Colburn House, and he would go up the street a little ways to uh, what is Ye Old Tavern today and run Ye Old Tavern. So as we get to about 1905, you know, we look, so the tannery is gone. So that shot that I had where you saw all the buildings and, you know, there was, I mean, you know, it's all gone. All the buildings that were on the, the west side of, of the Batten Killer are gone. Everything is gone for the most part on the east side where the tannery is, except for the stack is the only thing that remains. This is the back of Factory Point Place or Factory Point a Bank Building, you know, with this big square. It, it didn't get any awards for architectural design. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can still see the dam down here, but for the most part, everything is gone. You know, and what happened to the large mill pond, just to show you the mill pond here, 
it became a cow pasture. <laughs> uh, you know, just before, th these pictures were probably taken in, you know, 1910, 1915. A little closer up view, you can see here's, here's the cow down here grazing. You can see the corner of what is the bookstore building up here. And this building is gonna play a little bit of a story here, this little thing with the peak on top of it. That's the, actually the engine house. Fire engine. Uh, the engine house, uh, so this is looking across the mill pond. So today this, this, log, this log dam is actually concrete. You can see that's the iron bridge. And you can see this building, that's the engine house with the large, uh, large lookout. At some point the wind blew it over. That's what I read in the minutes of the, the fire department. I'm not sure, exactly sure when because they weren't too clear on it other than they were building a shorter one because they didn't want anybody to be up there when, uh, when, it, when it went over. So as they realized that this iron bridge had basically run its course, by 1912 they decided to build a marble bridge. And since they had Norcross West here quarrying up in, in South Dorset, there was plenty of marble and the people to build these things. So they built the Marble Arch Bridge, uh, you know, which was the end all be all. This was the only thing they were gonna need. You can see the engine house now has its smaller lookout. This is looking from across the, uh, uh, from the other side, and you can see there's, you know, the combination cash store, which is the mountain goat today. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with this guy over here, with this hoisted over, if it had fallen down into the river, it's one of those things where there's no explanation, so, and I haven't come up with a good enough story of what he's doing. Um, but it was really a magnificent bridge. It was actually so magnificent that actually, right when they were opening up the bridge, uh, President Taft came into town. He was on a six-day motor tour of New England. Uh, he went up to see the family, uh, the family homestead up in West Townsend. Uh, That's where his father was born. It actually turns out his father w w served as President Grant's attorney general. Um, Taft came into town. He had three automobiles. There were supposed to be five, but two of them carrying the newspaper men. And the baggage got lost in Windhall. <laughs> <laughs> they did eventually uh, catch up with them. Uh, and and they all, they, the, all the newspaper men and, and, and uh, some of the aides stayed at the Equinox and, and Taft went to uh, Hill Dean to spend the night. He gave a talk at the, at the music hall. Sarah Clughorn actually, this is one of those pages that I was telling you about those journals. This is so, there's a picture of Taft in front of the Equinox and this is Sarah's, um, that's Sarah's own writings on what she had to say about that. And it's brief and she said the journalist was too late to reach the music hall uh, for haven't we all yet to learn to call it the casino they'd, re they'd rebranded it and you know I, I don't know about everybody here but when something gets a new name it takes about a generation for it to get <laughs> killed uh, to hear the president's address or rather brief friendly greetings to our village but those who were present said that the president received the most enthusiastic reception from the crowd who packed every inch of the hall and she goes on, and after that, there's about 700 people in the music hall. And he stood in line and shook everybody's hand, inclu including Sarah's. Um, W.H. Shaw actually invited the president to come to the next day. They were having uh, the opening of the Marble Bridge. And unfortunately, Taft was leaving early the next morning, wasn't going to be able to make it, and said, congratulations. He's very glad to see the improvements. He did drive over the bridge the next morning because he was on his way to Montpelier to give a talk to the state house. And, but we have this and it's actually, I borrowed it from the Shaw family and they allowed me to scan it and share it with all of you here. You know, so that bridge, but you know, guess what? By the 1940s, it wasn't big enough. <laughs> So these pictures were taken by Paul Fowler, so they had to make it larger yet again. And they added the concrete and made it a little bit wider. Uh, over here looking, some of you may remember the, the Chevy dealership over here, Bon Chevy. Uh, eventually it became Han Chevrolet and they tore that down and built the, the new building that's actually still there in the back. And they built that in, I think, 78? Is that when they bought that? Yeah, 77 or 78. Uh, you know, looking back towards, you know, this is now, oh God, what is this building now? Epoch. Epoch, right. Timberland. <laughs> um, uh, this is kind of a neat little shot. This is the Fowler Insurance Building, which was built in 1927. And I'll just mention, that, you know, you can see up here, there's a little tiny sign up here that says Bromley, seven miles. It's a little tiny thing up here. And then you can see down here is the Winter Sports Club, which would eventually become the Bromley Outing Club. It was kind of the first incarnation of the Bromley Outing Club because Fred Paps had take, was good friends with the Fowlers and, you know, he needed a place down here in the, down in the center to conduct his business. 
Does that sound about right, Kit? <laughs> um, you know, here's a shot, and you can see that sign got much bigger much later on. I think it was probably the last billboard in Vermont, actually. I think it got grandfathered in and grandfathered in, and the Kimballs told me that when they wanted to redo, uh, they were redoing the gristmill, and, or no, they were redoing something, they were repainting it, and one of the trade-offs was they had to get rid of the sign. <laughs> so it came down. Um, one of the things, this is kind of a neat little thing, so all those marble pillars that were along the bridge that were installed in 1912, and then you notice back here they're all gone, well, where'd they go? Well, if you go up to the Art Center and you look at the entrance of the Art Center, <laughs> you see a couple of them there, and then you go up West Road a little ways, and you can see a little entrance to the driveway there, and if you drive down Mount Aeolus Lane, you see there's four of them there on either side of the bridge. And I took a picture of this when I got back and, and looked at it and noticed there was kind of a blue upside down, uh, <clears throat> what was the right thing to say here? <laughs> so Bill tagged it. Uh, if you go down to Factory Point, uh, if you go down to the park, they actually the one, this one particular pillar actually used to sit at the corner of North Road and Mount Aeolus Lane and it was the bus stop for the kids. Uh, Todd West told me a great story. They remembered it being there. They would go up and there was, there was a lady, and I'm drawing a blank on her name, who actually had a little flower garden around it and, and kept it for many years. And it's basically uh, for Douglas Dyer, uh, Nate Canfield, and Freight Walker, who were the selectmen who played a major part in the building of the Marble Bridge, and F. Day Giddings was actually the builder. And of course, in the late 60s, they decided to make it a little bit bigger yet again. <laughs> and then, of course, in 2014, they started the roundabout project, and when they were when they were dredging up the road, actually, they uh, you could see a little bit of the marble arch was still there, and they cut some of it away, which I see. some of it's still under there, but they yep. did take away a, a rather yeah, large I think section you can of canoe it. Canoe it and see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know that engine house that I was mentioning. Uh, they actually, 1921, you know, one of the things people say, well, where is this house and where was that house? Everything got picked up and moved. There was no plumbing, there was no electricity, so they would just pick up a house and, and they'd move it. And there weren't a lot of wires. And there weren't a lot of overhead wires. So in 1921, they picked up the engine house and they moved it. And this is a picture of it going up Main Street. This is actually, this building right here uh, was, would, would be picked up in the late 1960s and moved move to the back. Uh, it would be it's long ago and far away today. But it's interesting to notice they just put little tiny rollers down, moved it down the road instead of big tires or something else, it just slowly. And, and this, is coming this is coming past uh, the Heinel house at the time, which be, you know, eventually would become the shop. Uh, and an odd thing, go back for a second if you would, where the bank is now, which is Peoples or something, the old Merchants Bank. That was a, right where he's pointing was a marble retaining wall and there was nothing, just dropped off there. And when I was working on the bank a million years ago, we sort of discovered some of that. There were marble sidewalks and everything there, but there was that fence and you just went right down the river. And I was told there was really good sledding back in the 50s. <laughs> Very good, um, and actually, and it, what's interesting is you can see there's a little cow standing there on that, that fence, so I wonder if, it, you know, I should ask Mike, Michael to find out if it was a Heinel's cow. Right. <laughs> um, so they moved, they moved the engine house to Adams Park, and then in 1924, three years later, it caught on fire. <laughs> and actually, it was Warren Adams who started a small fire because he was getting the upstairs room warmed up because the band had, pra had rented the hall to do practice in. And he went back home, and when he came back, the whole thing was full of smoke, and they ended up having to put it out. And unfortunately, Warren, this would have been Harry's son, actually, he died in a theater fire in 1937 down in the depot, the modern theater, which is now where the parking lot is for Al Ducci's. He was in the film room, and it was cellulose film, and something went wrong in the cellulose film caught on fire and he died of the burns. Um, it, was, it would have been Helen Hurley's brother. And so when the, when the engine house caught on fire, it caused a, you know, a little bit of a problem. So they decided they weren't going to keep the pumper in the engine house anymore. So they moved it across to, then it would have been Robert's Garage today, Northshire Living. And when they were moving it across, you can see that's actually Harry Adams peeking over the... Uh, and, it, and he's standing right about where the stone, there's a large field stone with a plaque in it to Harry Adams. So if you ever go to the farmer's market, take a walk over there and look at the plaque that's on, on uh, 
And did you have a story about that you wanted to tell, or do we not want to tell it? We don't know what happened to that pumper. There are stories out there. We don't know for sure what happened to that pumper. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is what the engine house looks like today. It became wines by George. You can still see it has the uh, it has still has the lookout without without the dome on the top, but. And it was the fire department until 1965 when they built the fire department down on, on Depot Street, which got raised and they put up those three uh, retail outlets. Um, so the last little bit of the tannery, which I'm gonna tell, and this is where, you know, I have all these pictures and I could never think of a way I was ever gonna be able to share them with people. This is the mill pond. There used to be this enormous building where they, they, where they kept all the, uh, the hides while they were drying. Uh, this looking back the other way, this, this photo was taken about um, probably about 1900. You can still see, I mean, even though the tannery is gone, you know, the, the, the stack was still there. It was a 60 foot stack made out of brick. And in 1911, they took it down. It was actually, there was a, a Mr. Goodell took that down. I don't know if that's related to Donnie Goodell, but I'll have to ask him if I see him. And Delwood Cemetery had purchased all the bricks. And when he actually took down that stack, they all smashed. So they didn't actually make it over to Delwood as far as I know. But Maybe a few of them did. Uh, so the tannery was the landmark. I mean, they actually, it was, the people lamented that it was gone because that was like, you know, uh, the last vestige of the factory point days. So when 1911 and that came down, everybody complained that the stack was gone. Um, the Bensons owned it for a number of years. Uh, it kept moving in and out of, in, you know, changed from apartment to businesses. Uh, you can see actually there's some there's some corn growing here, which would be about where the parking lot is for uh, Ralph Lauren today. And then we can see the Atlantic and Pacific Company came in and opened up, you know, they took over the corner of the building. Uh, then we get into the, the Manchester Motors era. So they, you know, a car dealership was built on where the green is today and they had that. And then in 1954, uh, Katie Dillman's uh, dad had a shot there with uh, Tom Dibble and I forgot her name. Edith. Edith. Edith, Edith, Edith Snare. So, um, and you can see and during this time, the, the, uh, the Chevy, the, the Ford dealership was owned by the Dooley family. And you can see here's that building over here on the left. And I'm gonna do a little Norman Rockwell side story here. Um, this is actually from Mike Dooley sent, this, sent me an email with a note about this. He said, Dad owned Manchester Motors and sold Ford Lincolns and Mercuries. Norman Rockwell asked Dad to bring his two boys and wife to his home in Arlington to do an illustration that he would feature us. He said, for some reason, Dad was busy, so he sent a salesman, Slip Powers, for a stand-in, <laughs> missing his moment as a Rockwell subject. Uh, Mike said, Rockwell lined up the cars out front, climbed up a stepladder, took a few pictures, said, that's it, thanks, folks. And he was gone, and he said, so that was, it was him, his brother Jim, uh, his mom, Taffy the dog, me, and Slip Powers. And his brother, uh, his brother Jim actually uh, would, was a 1960 graduate of Burn Burton Seminary, and he would be shot down over North Vietnam in his A4 Skyhawk on October 22nd, 1967. He was 24 years old. Uh, when he was shot down, there was no communication or parachute scene after he pulled off target after being hit by any aircraft fire. Um, he was listed as MIA and his status changed to KIA in 1973. Um, one of his sisters did go over to Vietnam in 93 to do further research, but Jim was never found. And last month, the family sent a large collection of his belongings to us here, including his flight jacket that you see here, which is actually downstairs. So if anybody has any interest, you can give me a call or shoot me an email. And we have an enormous, I mean, the collection of papers that the Dooley family had kept, all of his letters are downstairs. But opening up this box and seeing his jacket was, uh, you know, it was a moving experience. Um, the, um, you know, that was an apartment building. So by the, by the 1950s, you know, it was apartments upstairs. And there's kind of a, a great little story about the, one of the women who lived in that apartment. And she's the first lady in this picture up here, Maud, who's talking to Jim Comar's grandmother. <laughs> and so Jack Kriegis, uh, he, he, had, he had written this note about his grandmother. Uh, he said, Maud Valley was born in 1897 and died in 1983. She lived her entire life in Manchester, Vermont, and in true Vermont tradition, never traveled further than being able to sleep in her own bed when night came. At 53 years of age, she took my brother and me to her home and cared for us until we were able to make our own way in the world. For this, I have been forever grateful. 
This was a lady who was far more than a grandmother. She shared her skills and knowledge and saw the world in a better light. She loved baseball, gave advice to a local senator, Reed Lefebvre, and made the best apple pie ever. At the time of growing up, there are many things you don't realize until you are older and have more life experience. It is only after it is too late that you understand how much someone has influenced your life and how indebted you are to them. So I know everybody recognizes the gossips, but you know that's kind of a nice little story to talk about her. And, and she indeed was very good friends with, with Reed Lefebvre. That's her standing behind Reed, uh, walking into a surprise birthday party at the VFW, and by the look on Reed's face, he looks like it worked. <laughs> uh, you know, Sadly or not, in 1967, actually, that building was torn down, and that was kind of the last vestige of, of the tannery that remained, and it was torn down to make a little bit more room for the car dealership. They needed to have more room. Um, I did find out that this large building here, if you go down to the Sunderland Transfer Station, uh, and you go up on the hill where they have all the dumpsters, that's the building that's there. <laughs> so I guess in a way... <laughs> Um, and these are out of order because I was going to show this one. You can see this is a, the, the smaller, smaller building. And you can see this is where the car dealership was. This is the Chinese restaurant. You know, all these, this is all gone. Now, this is about where theory is today. Um, and the car dealership in the early 1990s moved out to East Dorset next to what is Jiffy Mart, the East Dorset General Store. This photo was actually taken by Victor Rolando in 1992, showing them they were ripping up the pavement. And I think the, the strange idea for some people came over that they should turn this into a town green. And I met with Rich the other day at Charlie's to talk to him about how it all came together and you know, how crazy it was. I was bartending at the park bench when this was all going around. And remember people coming in and saying, that's a super fun site. I can't believe they're gonna do that. You know what they used to empty the oil? They'd just dump it over the bank. And there was a tannery there. They're crazy. People are gonna go down there. <laughs> Well, and one of the reasons I think Vic was interested in, and Vic Rolando was, and he's still alive, but he was Mr. Industrial Archaeology in Vermont and lived in you know, Shaftesbury or somewhere at that point. But he was convinced that there was an early iron furnace up the river, kind of where the, the, the pond was, and, the, and he'd find evidence of kind of Schlag. I think that's what they called it. Yeah, bits of burned ore and stuff that had been down. And, and there was an iron business. North Dorset was an iron town. And East Dorset still has its furnace behind a bed and breakfast or whatever it is. So there was, and they were mining bog iron. But Vic was always interested in saying, you know, he, he could never find any reference to it but he was, just from the artifacts he found along the river, was convinced that something had been going on there. And I think I saw Rich and Martha come in here, but I can't see that. Hey, there you go. All right. So now we gotta make sure that that coffee was worth it <laughs> that we had. Um, so the, so the, the, Manchester, uh, the Manchester Conservation Commission, they, they raised funds through private. They got some grants. Um, and they raised enough money to, to start the town green. And I think we mentioned it was actually, maybe it was Martha who mentioned, instead of calling it the town green, that Berkshire Bank had just purchased Factory Point Bank and there was really nothing left in Manchester that had the name Factory Point associated with it. So did I get that right? Okay, good, a thumbs up. So we can thank Martha for, for uh, the name Factory Point Town Green. And it did turn into a green space, which is beautiful. And, and I ran into another person uh, today. I ran into Bob Standard, who I asked him a couple questions about how the whole thing came together. And he said, well, you could thank Ralph, Ralph Sparkman for having that big berm there. So when you drive by, you can't see that there's a green there. <laughs> um, but, you know, and then in, in, on 9-11-2015, on uh, they, they installed the walk. And you can see that they had put in the base for the bandstand. Uh, the bandstand was dedicated in, 20, uh, tw in 2016 as the Ivan Beatty Pavilion Bandstand. Uh, Ivan is actually the great-grandson no, yeah. great grandson of Harry Adams. You've got to be really careful. Harry Adams has so many descendants in this town that if you throw a rock, you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll likely hit him. Uh, the latest addition to the town green would be uh, Orlin Campbell had uh, designed this monument uh, in loving memory of all who have served 
and of the men and women of this valley who gave up their lives and their dreams for this nation, for us who stand here today to remember and say thank you. Uh, this was, uh, was created up at um, Boker and Sun Memorials and an old Ido and did the installation. Uh, Wayne, who I think just ran out, actually took some pictures in the wee or early morning when they were hanging it up. And it was installed on October 22nd, 2019, 52 years to the day after Jim Dooley was shot down over North Vietnam. There's a little connection I made when I was putting this together. Um, we're getting kind of towards the end. We only have about 100 more slides. <laughs> so, but I, did, I think it would be a little remiss if we didn't tell a little bit about this when I mentioned where the uh, Sirloin Saloon was, this chase. This shows you this was the chase that went down. There was a dam. This actually photo was taken in the 1940s of the dam. It was during the winter. Um, you can see this is the hulking mass of was the BB Marble Mill. And it's kind of a little bit difficult to see, but for those of you who remember the saloon, remember the cupola, the distinctive cupola that was on top. Um, and this is what it looked like in 1925, you know? I mean, there was nothing going on there. There was no trees, there was no uh, shopping center. You look like you want to. Uh, and this is, where, this is where, the, uh, where that dam is. Just to show you what it looked like when it was actually a marble mill. It's one of the few pictures we have of it when it was, the, uh, when it was a marble mill. And actually, this house right here, uh, our former fire chief, Grubb, his mom lived in that house. Born and raised in that house, I believe. Um, and of course, there's the Sirloin Saloon. <laughs> but, as all of you know, the Sirloin Saloon was torn down. And Vic was, Vic was on hand, as was Bill Badger. And I'm gonna let him talk about this little part right here. Well, I always knew there was a, a sub-basement and nobody could seem to find it. I think he went through a trap door. And when they were working there with the excavator, we told the guy, you might be careful because he was kind of going in the middle of things and said, just be careful because you might vanish. And he dug up stuff and that was the turbine. And it's lying on its side but that was why the sub-basement was there, because this raceway had come in, dropped the water in, <clears throat> gone through the turbine, and then exhausted out across the road and into the batten kill. And, you know, it's not in very good shape, but it was kind of a bit, an interesting bit of our archaeological history. Yeah, and these pieces, um, you know, which is all the turning parts that were kind of above grade, so to speak, um, we did save these. They're not on display right now. They're actually down at Skinner Hollow Farm. Um, because that'll lead us, because Eric Severance, who's, who's been a member of our board and always been so helpful. Um, actually, we have, Ben Halbin actually did play a critical role in making sure, you know, that we could have it, that it could be moved so it could be put on display. And then uh, Eric and his son, Justin, actually, in 2017, we moved it, it actually sat over in the bushes behind Manchester Woodcraft for- We figured nobody would steal Three it. years. <laughs> and then in 2017, uh, you know, we were able, uh, we were able to get get it moved over to its current, current place. And if you go down to Riverwalk, you'll see the turbine and a little story about how it's there and why it's there. Um, it's a little bit more closer up. So the last thing I'll say, well not the last thing I'll say about Riverwalk was, um, this is a great little story in 1976. Uh, you know, the, they mentioned the Eagles Clubhouse in the story. Uh, Ted Hopkins actually was, they were gonna build, as part of the, uh, as part of the Bar Centennial, they were gonna build a footpath. And they built a bridge going across the West Branch. <laughs> and they, they indeed did build a beautiful truss bridge that went across the West Branch. Um, unfortunately, there was an incident there where somebody lost their life and it caused a lot of, um, you know, they decided that they didn't want people hanging out down there. It was, I'm still not exactly sure what happened because there's not a lot of newspaper reports and anytime it comes up on social media, it causes a lot of consternation. But what I can tell you is the, uh, the marble abutment that it went against is actually still there next to what's been serving as the bridge across the West Branch. <laughs> So we're gonna get into our last little section. Everybody, everybody, I got, we probably got about 10 more minutes. Everybody good? Yeah. We good? Yeah. Um, yes, we are, although I have to say that I thought we were gonna be done by seven. I have to remember the next time I schedule you, I give you two hours. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we could end right here. That's we don't right. have we're, to get into it. We're done. You want to do it? <laughs> but I do want to say that, you know, I hope everybody will stay, but if you, if you do have to leave, you know, we understand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, show of hands. Who can sit for another 10 minutes or who? All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep going. Those of you who did raise your hand, you are free to leave, and I will not hold any grudges. <laughs> um, so the last part that we're going to talk about is the Norcross. Um, you know, why am I showing this? This is the New York Public Library. If you've been down to Manhattan and you see this large marble structure, you know, it all originated in South Dorset. <clears throat> when the Norcross brothers came here, they got like a $2.8 million um, contract to build, you know, to build this library. He wanted pure white marble. He was in Philadelphia. He saw one of the Friedley, the Friedley buildings, said, where did this come from? And they said, Dorset. So he came up here and he found a, a willing partner in, in Spafford Holly West, and he started quarrying. And the reason why we're bringing this up is because, you know, the, everybody knows the swimming quarry and nobody really knows, or a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that once all the marble was removed from the quarry, it went to the mill. And that is the mill that stood on Richville Road, which is about where Earth and Sea and Stepping Stones, uh, Stepping Stones daycare is. This building right here is still there, and I'll, tell, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, this mill was basically started in the beginning in 1901, and by 1902, it was in business. They expanded it multiple, multiple times. Uh, the, the lot that it was on was um, about 10 acres, and they had as many as 300 people working there at the height of the quarrying operations. And this, the reason we're showing this is this is kind of the last gasp of industrial Manchester. And even though it's kind of what we would classify as the depot, there were no hard lines. This was you know, the, the big mill that was going to, Manchester still had industrial capability at that point. And in 19, in, after the quarrying operations had kind of ceased around 19, well, at the mill probably around 1915, and they stopped all the operations by 1917, uh, the 1930s, they were making noises that they needed to tear this big hulking thing down. And really, Roberts bought the office building. And he picked it up, and he moved it across the street directly across the street, and it still sits there today on Richville Road. As a matter of fact, the windows don't line up because not only did he pick it up and move it across the street, but he didn't turn it around. <laughs> so this is actually the back of the office building. Uh, uh, this is, gives you an idea. This is, this is, these two parcels of land are what the mill, what the mill covered. And so at one time, and we did actually do a, a G-Mall talk on the Norcross West Mill, so if you want to know more about this, go to Gmall website and look us up. Or actually, is that up yet? Yes, I believe so. Is it? I think okay. so. If no, not, it's Rich coming is. soon. One or the other. Yeah, it's gonna be, it'll be up soon. Yeah. You know, again, one of the things that they brought the Teamsters down, but they, they needed to get so much marble down in Manchester that, of course, what do you think they did? They built the railroad. They built the railroad. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? Yep, they bought an old used locomotive from the Rutland. We won't get into which number it was. And uh, got it refurbished and, and ran uh, almost until the end. But after... Um, 1917. Well, well, what's his name died? 19 oh, when, yeah, when uh, yeah. Spafford died. It died. That it was like, now what do we do with it? And the, the whole mill was intended to last for generations. But, you know, the, the people that really were the power behind it um, weren't able to do it anymore. So West's son finally sold it to Vermont Marble. Vermont Marble was just buying up all the competition. They just wanted to be the marble company in Vermont. So they weren't really very interested in running it because they had better quarries up north. So they bought it, ran it for a while. I think they were doing all Shut the finishing down. at that point up north. And... Um, World War I was coming on, 1917. There wasn't the demand for dimension stone. There had been architectural styles were changing. And 1917 was the last year they worked it. A lot of those blocks, they just cut, piled, and there was no market for them, so they're still sitting there. And um, meanwhile, when Vermont Marble took over, they junked this old engine, brought one of their engines from their own railroad down. So the last couple of years, for a railroad standpoint, are kind of interesting. But it was the, the operation that was built to last 
generations didn't. And again, it was the same thing with the, the tanneries and stuff. When, if you could build it, if you could make, produce the marble more economically in West Rutland or Proctor, why did you need another plant down here? And they didn't. Um, all, these, all these towns, as I think I started with, had industries, and you talked about the little one over behind um, in Orvis's Pond. Oh yeah, you know, Munson Brook. They, they, would, they would set up a, a mill on nothing, on a stream you could step across. And they would, they would build a dam so they would get water backed up behind it. And in August, you probably didn't use it much. And when they, they would let the water out of the dam, they would run the mill. And if it ran out at noontime, everybody went home to the farm. And I've seen little mills up in Landgrove, and you look around, and you go, what was here? But all the foundations are there. And you look up some of the, bro the little streams coming up out of Weston, and there were just rows of little tiny shops that made all kinds of wooden things. Um, we have a, somewhere a, one of those knife boxes, silverware boxes that sits on a dining room table made from pieces of an abandoned mill in South Londonary. My father collected the pieces and made a, a box from it. But they all got put out of business by the, the next bigger mill and didn't survive. And, and Manchester hung on longer and, and the operations were bigger, but even this finally gave it up. Yeah, so they spent the equivalent of millions of dollars to build all this infrastructure in 1900 and by 1936 it was gone. Uh, you know, the MDNG basically it was started in 1902. The first train ran in 1903, and they did half passenger service. Uh, you know, so for 15 cents, you could take, you could make a, uh, you could make a round trip, or if, you could single fare for 15 cents and 25 cents. You could go from the depot to uh, to uh, South Dorset. Um, this is a shot to give you an idea where the where the where the line went. This is going from that property where the mill was. You can see. Uh, this was Center Hill Past and Presence, and now is the barn at Center Hill. That's the house that's out front, and you can see Factory Point Cemetery above. And you see all this marble stacked along the spur. Now, if you go to, I, actually, I shouldn't say this publicly, but you could just take my word for it that if you were to park at Earth and Sea and kind of walk towards the brush line, it's, there's, all the marble is still stacked all the way, that runs all the way down to the foot of Lincoln Avenue. And look out for ticks. And look out for ticks. <laughs> Ask yeah. me how I know. I, I, I took this picture in the, in the late, uh, er, very early spring when it was still, uh, I wasn't really too worried about it. Um, and this is where it crossed the West Branch. You can see over here is where the, uh, the shopping center is, and this is the back of Discount Beverage. Uh, we have one picture of the, of, the, of the engine in Manchester pushing up into what was called the Barnumville Gulf. Uh, so it would just have crossed uh, Elm Street and then Spruce Street and then went up through the Gulf and would come out behind Northshire Day School, the current Northshire Day School. You see no trees, no nothing. Um, and if you actually go to Center Hill, the barn at Center Hill, and there's a parking lot right now, and this would be the backup. I think that's Carter's. And Starbucks is over here. Under, there's a big maple tree, and underneath that maple tree, there's a railroad tie with a spike stuck in it. And then you can see the, you can see the raised bed, and there's a big block of marble sitting in the middle of it. So there's still little glimpses here and there in Manchester of the industrial past. Um, so the passenger service, so just this will be, we're, we're kind of winding up here, but this, this building, this is where Ted's, Ted's uh, barber shop is. At the time, it actually would become uh, the Lake Veterinary Practice, and actually the Lake Veterinary Practice was taken over by Edwin Treat, Bob Treat, older Bob Treat's dad. Uh, so, uh, and we looked at this picture, and then you can see the line. I was like, oh, there's the line coming down through there. There's a railroad crossing, and then uh, there it is. So there was the Manchester, Dorset, and Granville Railroad train station. Kind of looks like something you'd wait for the school bus to show up on. <laughs> And a little bit closer, closer view of it. We've seen st pictures of the stations in South Dorset and at Quarry, but never what was in Manchester. And I couldn't figure out, did they come down? They wouldn't have gone out on the main line of the Rutland because that was a different railroad. And when we found this, I got all excited. And said, yeah, yeah, now I know what it is. So, you know, today, so the, the one little thing, the vestiges of that is you can go out on the rail trail, thanks to uh, a number of our local citizens. And if you haven't been out on the rail trail, you know, I highly suggest it. So, 
This is winding up, so I'm just gonna come back, you know, I'm gonna come back with a little Norman Rockwell here. This is actually a picture of Jimmy Heinel and, and Edwin Norse, uh, taken about 1954. That was industry in 1954. <laughs> they would, so Edwin said they would go out and shovel driveways for 50 cents each. Uh, the, do the dog was a collie that belonged to George Heaslip, who was the, owned the local oil company, and followed the two of us around pretty much everywhere. And the photographer who took this submitted it to popular photography in 1955 and were third place in a nationally photography contest. So you can see the quality restaurants over here on the left hand side. If you have a chance when you're leaving here, uh, we actually have a copy of War News which used to hang in the, above the family table at the quality and the clock uh, that hung above the soda and a little bit of a story there. So, um, and it was actually Wendy Comar who doted it to us and we had a wonderful evening called the Evening with the Comars where we have all the Comar kids here telling stories. MC'd by Mike Powers, which that you can look up too if you ever want to relive really that moment. What's that? What about the jukeboxes in there? Anybody put the dime in or whatever it was? You can still do that at the Blue Bend down in Bennington. Yeah. It's one of the last places. And when, even though it was under new ownership, they kept it. So that's it, Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not too bad. I saw, a great, I saw a great little thing on Instagram today. He said, you know, when you go to those talks or when you're on Zoom, they should have one of those cues where they start playing Oscar music. When you're going on too long, you start hearing the music. Uh, yes, did anybody have any questions? Or is everybody like, we got to go. Well, hold on. Hemlock bark was used in the tanning process.